everybody, welcome to the podcast. Jeff here. I'm going to do something a little bit differently this week. In 2022, I was invited to the Undersea Hyperbaric and Medical Society's scientific meeting. I was up in Reno, Nevada, to speak at the ORCA project. ORCA stands for Operational Resilience and Cognitive Awareness. So it's a mouthful. But what I was invited to speak on as the head of a training agency was how we teach human factors in scuba diving. There's been a ton written about human factors. There are courses in human factors in scuba diving. There's tons of material you can research. Basically, human factors is a way to address how people perform in a particular situation. And in our case, it affects safety. So how are we training people to work together? What are the human factors that we're teaching to get people to work together in pursuit of safer diving? So this was a day of talks by various industry professionals from the military, from NASA. There were scientists, there were doctors, there was an astronaut there, there were physicists. There were a couple of people who represented the training side of things. And I did this talk and it was well received. So I wanted to just present it to you as a podcast and it's also a video. You can find it on our video channel. So I hope you enjoy it. If you have any questions or comments, be sure to leave us a note at info at utdscubadiving.com. And here is the talk from the Orca Project. Hey, everybody. When I was asked to do this presentation, I started thinking once I saw what everybody else was talking about, that UTD is sort of a case study in teaching human factors in scuba diving. Today, though, I want to talk about the secret what I think is the secret to teaching human factors in scuba diving. So I'm going to start with a little bit of history of UTD so you kind of get to know what we are, who we are. Unified Team Diving, now called UTD Scuba Diving, is a global certification and training agency. We're one of the 20 or so agencies in the U.S. and all over the world. We have instructors on almost all continents. We've been doing this since about 2008. We started the agency as a group of instructors who basically wanted to teach the way we dive. So we were cave divers, technical divers, tech instructors, cave instructors, but we were all teaching for other recreational agencies, and we wanted to bring our style of diving to recreational training. Or that would be team protocols, first and foremost, diving neutrally buoyant, diving without silting up the bottom, diving with consistent equipment. So I'm going to talk about some of this later on, but we built the agency with 10 instructors at the first IDC in a little dive shop in San Diego, and it's been growing and growing and growing ever since. In 2019, we split the company into two pieces. We had an equipment division and a training division. I bought the training division. My ex-partner took the equipment division. But the whole point of this on the education side was to be an agency where we teach the way we dive. What I'm going to talk about today is a lot about our training program for instructors, because no matter what we talk about in any kind of training, it has to start with the trainers. So I am a UTD instructor, trainer, 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 trainer. I come from flight instruction, mostly in competition aerobatics. So I was an aerobatic pilot, instructor, and coach. I ran contests. I ran training events, all of that. You can see if you're watching this on video, that's me in my little old single seat pit special. What a cool little airplane that is. I also come to this from an athletic standpoint. I race a bicycle at the national level, mostly on the track. I'm currently now in the middle of about a five year process to chase the US hour record in my age group. So I currently hold the age group hour records at the San Diego Velodrome and the fixed gear course record at the World Six Hour Time Trial Championships. So I'm working on this pretty much every day. But what's interesting about this is that it's not just scuba diving that we use to start a training agency. We took all of this. We took flying. We took athletics. We took coaching. We took all of these things and we put them into an agency and said, how can we do this? How can we create an education program that will actually manage proper training in team diving? The kind of diving that we've always done just naturally. It turns out that it's much more of a mental game than it is equipment, physical, or any of that. This is one of my favorite quotes from Yogi Berra. Baseball is 90% mental and the other half is physical. 
Well, you could certainly apply this to flying. I think that's obvious, but absolutely you can apply it to diving. If your brain is not on straight, then there's no point strapping on a tank. This is a huge piece of the puzzle that we instill in our instructors. It goes back to what I think. There's a secret to teaching human factors in scuba diving, and that is just to keep it a secret. Just don't tell anybody. Just wrap it into the training program. We built a training program around team diving. You could say we were teaching human factors, but it didn't matter. We just took this concept of proper team diving using team protocols and started at the top with an education program. I've always said this could have been anything, right? I was looking for a career change when we started UTD. At that time, I was in the film industry and looking to get out, and it could have been anything to get me out. It could have been rocket science, it could have been auto mechanics. It didn't matter to me. I was just looking for an education program to build. It happened to be scuba, which fortunately is something I'm really passionate about. So when we built the program out, we built it out like an FAA Part 141 flight school. That was kind of our model. We have ground school, we have integrated or blended training, we have critical skills training, something the FAA calls scenario-based training. And this was right at the time when cockpit resource management was sort of trickling down into single engine Cessna 150s and Piper Cherokees, which was a really interesting time when I was teaching flying and teaching scuba and working to see how those two things really interact and come together. UTD is a recreational training agency. We don't teach occupational diving, except for a little bit of scientific diving, and we don't teach commercial diving. We teach public safety divers, but not public safety diving. We just teach public safety divers to be better divers. This community of public safety divers generally come to our programs for recreational or tech or cave or whatever it is, and as a community, they generally don't know how to train as a team. They don't come from NASA or the military or someplace that just instills this from the beginning. They just come from down the street. Often they're just open water divers with a rescue certification and show up on the team. So we have to instill in them team procedures from day one. And again, this starts with our instructors. Okay, let's take a little bit of a left turn. What is education? Education is classically defined as creating a change in behavior in your students. Well, that's awesome. But if you create a change in behavior and there's no retention, then there's no point. So we teach our instructor development program with classical education techniques. We show the instructors, the future instructors, how to communicate content to their student in a way that will change their students' behavior and give those students a system or a method to retain the new information. One of the ways we do this is with our old friend Thorndike and his laws of learning. I think one of the most important of his laws in teaching scuba diving is the law of primacy. The law of primacy basically says the first thing you learn is the thing you'll remember the most or maybe remember the best. It's very simple, as are the rest of these laws. And we use all the others, readiness, effect, exercise, intensity, recency, but the law of primacy is critical. I'll just tell you a very short story. I had my very first tech instructor a gazillion years ago, but I remember this like it was yesterday. I got my first dry suit. We go out to the dive site and the instructor puts on his dry suit. And the first thing he does is kneel down and squeeze all the gas out of the suit. So I kneel down and squeeze all the gas out of my suit. You squish it down. And when you stand up, you look like you're in this sous vide bag about to jump in a pot of hot water. The thing is so tight. And then, of course, what's the first thing you do in a dry suit that doesn't have any gas in it when you get in the water? You put gas in it. So it actually makes no sense to squeeze all the air out of your suit before you get in the water. But I did it for months until I finally realized that the only reason this instructor was doing it is because he wanted to look cool. It was all about instructor ego. He got to walk around the parking lot with this super tight male model costume on, but he also would get in the water and the first thing, when we weren't looking, he'd put gas in his suit. It didn't make any sense, but we all did this because this is what we learned first from our instructor. So the law of primacy becomes this very powerful tool that we use to guide people through the process of team diving and get their minds changed a little bit to the point where this is the norm. 
the team is the norm. Your team is your backup brain, your backup equipment, your backup navigation system. Everybody's got a job, all of that. And we've done a couple of things to help our instructors do this, teach this. Every training agency has standards and procedures. Standards and procedures are the things that you have to do. But we wrote a book called The Instructor Playbook. And we started this at that very first IDC back in 2008. The Instructor Playbook is how to do it. It's advisory in nature. It outlines courses, critical skills training, which is basically how to create emergency training in scuba diving for more advanced diving, both for recreational and tech. We started doing critical skills training as if we're diving in a simulator, having the students in a simulator. And again, I go back to that same instructor in the dry suit. And he would, when he was training technical divers, do failure after failure after failure on the team. You're out of gas, your mask comes off, you do this, your valve is free flowing, failure on top of failure until the team completely fell apart. And we'd make our way to the surface and then we get yelled at. And as a logical human being who just likes to dive, this didn't make any sense to me at all. It just didn't seem like good training. So we wrote the playbook. One of the cool things about the playbook is we figured out which class connects with which critical skills that the students need to know so they can get out of trouble if they get into it. Now, when you're diving and you have a ceiling, either a hard ceiling, like in a cave or a wreck, or a soft ceiling, like a decompression obligation that you can't go through, that critical skills training has to be more structured than if you're in a dive scenario where you can slowly come to the surface and solve your problem on the surface. However, we never want somebody just launching to the surface. The idea is, if you have an emergency or a situation, you still have to make all your stops on ascent. So we outline critical skills. We put them in a different level for each class. Our recreational classes, these are level one critical skills, which are really basically demonstration only. I'm taking out my regulator, you're taking out your regulator. It's level one, more of a non-critical skill. Like, hey, I'm gonna tell you that you're out of gas and then you're gonna take your regulator out, turn to your buddy, signal out of gas and do an air share. As we move forward in training, level two, that's non-compounding surprise critical skills, one at a time. Okay, I'm gonna tap you on the shoulder and say you're out of gas, now deal with it. You turn to your buddy, you share gas, you establish exit strategy, and then we cut the drill or let you take it to the surface. But we don't add another critical skill at that level. Level three, this is seen at the beginning in our tech classes. These are compounding skills. You lose a mask, deal with it, and right away, you're out of gas. And we build up to these, but we wrote it down so there's no guessing. We're able to actually create these training scenarios to bind the team together with a system of procedures that are not random. Every UTD instructor who teaches every Tech 1 course does the same critical skills in the same order, and it's written down, and they all have the same book, and it's been awesome for consistent training. And all we're doing is we're teaching a version of human factors without telling anybody that's what they're getting. We don't have to make a big intellectual exercise out of it. And it's worked really well. The playbook is a living, breathing document. During every instructor development class, each of the instructor candidates is charged to edit a part of the book. And it's been amazing. We've created consistency within the training program. In equipment, the equipment is matched among the team. This seems so simple, right? Everybody has a long hose that they can donate from their mouth. So if you need gas, you're getting a regulator that works, not a 20-year-old octopus that's probably never been used and never been serviced. Your backup regulator is always on a necklace. You can always reach down and grab it, whether or not you can see it. Everybody has back inflate wings. Everybody has the same gear in their dry suit pockets. Daily stuff that you use on every dive goes in your right pocket. Things like wet notes and an SMB. Emergency stuff, that all goes in your left pocket. Spare mask, whistle, car keys, whatever. Why is that? Because you don't use it that much. And generally, deco bottles and stage bottles are on the left, so that pocket is harder to get to, while the right pocket is almost always clear. The stuff I use on every dive goes on the right, other stuff goes on the left, and we build the equipment system so it's consistent within the training program and after training is over during normal diving. So diving procedures, same thing. Everybody is trained in the same emergency procedures and the same non-emergency procedures. So out of gas, and we're not really calling it out of gas anymore because we don't really run out of gas. We're more calling it now gas not available. 
something breaks, something happens, a mouthpiece comes off, whatever. But the emergency procedures are the same for everybody who comes through any class, be it their first open water class or Tech 3, Cave 2, doesn't matter. And the training in normal procedures builds on all of this. If you're going to deploy a surface marker buoy, everybody knows exactly the procedure. Everybody is doing it the same way, and you can follow right along at the same time, and everyone has a job. One person deploys the buoy, one person pays attention to depth, and the third person pays attention to navigation and situational awareness. So the team is working as if it had one brain. Everybody's got a role. Everybody can do every role, but they're defined, and they're simple, and it's super safe. The other thing we did is we chose to use mnemonics rather than checklists. And the big disclaimer here, this is not for rebreathers. Rebreathers, we absolutely use written checklists. But what we found was in open circuit training, in open water, cave, tech, nobody had the checklist with them anyway. We'd make them on waterproof cards. We'd make, put them in the wet notes. Anyway, nobody actually used them. So we decided just to do mnemonics. But what we do in the mnemonics is make sure that people are not just paying lip service to the list that it actually triggers something they're supposed to do. So for pre-dive, glad, did, 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 right? Goal, leader, air, depth, duration, deco, direction, and distance. And the students are charged to go through this, or the divers on every dive are charged to go through this. What's the goal of the dive? What are we doing? Who's the leader? All right, you're the captain, you're the deco captain, so you're shooting the bag. So people have an understanding that mnemonics are a trigger not just a memorized thing that they spit out. Here's one that I've had for like 30 years. Ready? Mask, fin, snorkel, hood, boots, and gloves, gauges and weights, regulators, and a wetsuit. If I stand at the back of my car before I take off for a dive, and I do this mnemonic, mask, fin, snorkel, hood, boots, and gloves, gauges and weights, regulators, and a wetsuit, I pretty much know I have everything I need to get in the water. I have a mask. I have a fin. But it's not just that. It's the triggers that each of these words provides. So I have a mask. Yes, I have my primary mask, the prescription mask, the backup mask. It's inside my fin, so I must also have my fins. Do I need a snorkel? Yes or no. Which hood do I take? Thick, thin? It's the same I did years flying small airplanes. Just before you land, we had a mnemonic called GUMPS, gas, undercarriage, mixture, prop, seatbelt. If you do that and you check each of those five things, it's a pretty good bet you'll get on the ground in one piece. So mnemonics are a baseline of simplicity that gets you into the dive. They're not like a six-page rebreather checklist, but they work if you do them and if you teach them properly. So here's another famous thing, pointing and calling, made famous by the subway systems, the train systems in Japan. We do a very simple point and call. For a pre-dive buddy check, we just do top to bottom. I have a hood, you have a hood. I have a mask, you have a mask. I have a primary regulator and it works. Do you have a primary regulator and does it work? And so on down the body. It's really simple, but when it fails, it can be dramatic. Years ago, I was at the Catalina Dive Park off the coast of Los Angeles. And to get in the water, you walk down this flight of stairs. Catalina Island, if you haven't been there, is some of the most beautiful and simplest diving in California. So I queue up with my students. I was, I don't know, seventh or eighth to go down the stairs. On a beautiful day, it's just a line of people heading into the water. The guy in front of me has a back zip dry suit, and it's wide open. This was not my student, and he wasn't an instructor. He was just a student who was with a group, and I said to him, you may want to zip that thing up. Now, this could have been catastrophic, because who knows if he was overweighted, if the BC was hooked up, any of it. But his pre-dive buddy check obviously failed. So the pointing and calling thing is critical. The mnemonics are critical. The checklists where it's appropriate are critical. These are all elements of human factors training that we've just built into a training system and had in place now since 2008, and it just works really well. There is a reason we don't make human factors an intellectual exercise, and it's because the team is everything. If we teach team diving, then we don't have to worry about human factors because we're teaching human factors. We're teaching people to operate as a team. We're teaching people to do dives where their teammate is next to them, not six miles away, as that old joke about a buddy team is just two people in the same ocean. Everyone has one bottom timer because the team has three. Everyone has one SMB because the team has three. 
I really believe that we've been able to demonstrate over all these years globally through a proper training program for instructors and a proper training program for our instructor trainers that this works. In our students' very first open water class, they don't see a piece of equipment until they understand how to be neutrally buoyant in the water, just wearing a bathing suit. We get them neutrally buoyant on a mid-breath, and if they can't maintain that, we give them a little bit of neoprene to wear, like a vest or something. And if they're floating, we just give them a little bit of weight to hold in their hand. Once they find out they can control their trim by where they put that weight, then we start to show them how to do a frog kick and how to do a back kick. This is all the first half hour, 45 minutes of our open water class. They don't see a regulator for hours. And when they do see that regulator, it's floating down from the surface. They're still in a bathing suit. No mask, no fins, but they're learning how to back kick and they're learning how to frog kick and they're learning how to go up a meter, down a meter, up a meter, down a meter, just by using their breath control. Then we give them a mask and let them see what they're doing. Then we give them fins and let them see what a little propulsion is like. Then we continue to build them up. We often don't get to equipment, the real scuba equipment, until the second day. Once we get there, they're divers, because what's diving? Diving is controlling your body during a dive, generally using your breath. During our first day of actually going into open water in the ocean or lake, wherever they're working, our students look like our trimix divers. Our open water students, they look like our tech and trimix divers. They're neutrally buoyant, they're in horizontal trim, they're not silting, they're doing proper ascent profiles, and it's an amazing and beautiful thing that we've been able to accomplish. So I think we're a success story as a training agency in terms of teaching human factors. I'm super proud of what we've been able to create in the world of bringing these technical diving and human factor systems into very early recreational dive training. And so, in my opinion, and I will continue to hold this opinion, the secret to teaching human factors in scuba diving is just keep it a secret. 